Okay. Welcome to um, Divine Anarchy. I am your host, Matthew Mansell. You are watching this on uh, Voluntary Virtues Network. Uh, in this episode, I will be discussing part one of my series that I will be doing called God, the Enemy of the State. If you missed last week's episode, I went over the fact that I will be doing such a series, what the thesis was, and what the outline of the series would look like. Um, I will be giving you, as the last week of the intro, this week is part one of the actual series. An outline for the first four episodes, this is what you will be, be looking forward to in, in this episode and the next three episodes, um, unless I change my mind um, on order or information, is... In episode 1 and 2, The Proof of God's Existence, I originally planned on presenting all of this in one episode, but it dawned on me that it was too much for 30 minutes. So I, couldn't, it, it, I don't think it's possible to fit all of them in a 30-minute uh, time frame. So I divided that um, into two episodes. Um, so in which you have really somewhat slightly different argument, or type of argument being presented. Uh, the uh, next, uh, the, the third episode will be establishing God's sovereignty over creation. Uh, and then the fourth episode will be God's judgment uh, on man in the flood of Noah, uh, to delve right into the Bible in uh, the biblical account in that particular um, equation or in that particular um, episode. Uh, but to cover the arrangement of what these episodes will do, the proof of God's existence, I'll be covering logical proofs uh, for the existence of God. Um, to show that why belief in God is not irrational, not illogical uh, to do so. Um, or to have such a belief, rather it is perfectly rational, and I would argue that it's the most probable um, or, uh, conclusion that one could logically come up to, uh, at least I believe so. Uh, but I'm a theist, uh, so maybe an, an atheist may that would definitely disagree with me, but nonetheless, it's not illogical. It's not an illogical position, such as Richard Dawkins and a few others would have you believe, or even as Stefan Molyneux would have you believe. Uh, so, I, and I will, in this case, even uh, and the proof of God in one of the, the two episodes will even exclude the gods of the Greeks. Um, and the, the pagan gods of the Greeks and what have you, and even the Hindu gods, um, show why those gods would be not rationally be excluded, giving the knowledge of what we know about the universe, um, and how the only god that really could be described as either a deistic god at the very least, or a uh, a God of the uh, similar to the Abrahamic religions of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Uh, then I will establish God's sovereignty over creation, meaning we're talking about God as owner of the universe and all that is therein. And in this one, I will be dealing with philosophy of ownership um, and morality and well, even go into the Bible, because generally when we're talking in this episode, when we talk about God, the enemy of the state, we're talking strictly the Judeo-Christian God and the Judeo-Christian scriptures. Um, I'll let a Muslim, um, someone more versed in Islam, uh, deal with the Islamic God and Islamic 
argument for liberty um, if they want to, such as Davi Barker. Um, in fact, I may do an interview with him on that topic after I get done reading his book. But anyhow, the God Judges in the final episode will covering the flood uh, account that's revealed in the Bible and in Jewish literature, uh, talking about the background of the flood, what called, why did God decide to uh, to bring uh, about the flood, what was it that he was seeking to accomplish with the flood, etc. Uh, so that's what we will be discussing there. Um, so on to the outline of this episode. Like I said, this episode will be about the proof of God's existence. I divide it up into two episodes. Uh, the proof of God's existence up into two. This outline will have a traditional proof of God's existence. Or a semi-traditional, uh, it's actually a reworking of a traditional argument. Then a space argument from the space-time theory of rel- uh, space-time theorem of general relativity. Um, first published by Stephen Hawking. Uh, Hawking then and his uh, two other uh, scientists who the names escaped me uh, and the inner and the, the final argument dealt with energy becoming conscience argument number one goes as follows anything that begins to exist has a cause the universe began to exist Therefore, the universe has a cause. In order for the conclusion to be false, the, con- the two premises above must also be false. Now, this is different from the traditional argument. The traditional argument, as argued by Aquinas and other goes as following, that everything that, it ha- that exists has a cause to its existence, or has a reason for its existence. The universe exists, therefore the universe has a reason for its existence, has a cause. And then he argued that there that you cannot have a infinite regression of, cause, of causes. So you must at least have a, a, a first cause. And he argued that the first cause is God. Now the problem is uh, it's the premise about the first cause violates the first premise, which says that, or uncaused cause, the first cause violates the first premise that anything that exists has a cause for its existence. Uh, being if the first cause exists, the first cause has a reason for its existence as a cause, right? Do it become the form of question begging at that point. Um, you could then argue, uh, really question begging is, uh, 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 you could revise the statement that anything ha- that at the beginning, I'm sorry, anything that exists except for God has a cause, but only then you'd be begging the question. Um, you're you're conclu- you're, at that point, you're assuming the conclusion that a God exists. That's part of the premise. And you can't do that. So the atheist rationally, or and actually human, I think, I think human, and a few other logically um, critiqued uh, Aquinas on this area. Um... But this is not the argument. The argument here is that anything that begins to exist has a cause. The simple laws of causation, anything that begins to uh, go fast has a reason for it going fast. Anything that begins to move didn't just magically move. It had a reason for it being moved. Something moved it, being an engine started energy, uh, or combustion, or, or, or fuel, and the, and the engine, and that causes um, some type of power. I'm not sure exactly what all the physics is, and that that made the car go, right? Or made this object go. Or something that's moving 
hit against the object and causing it to move. So you actually have a just a mover. So in this case. You have the same principle. The, everything that has a cause, the, the laws of cause and effect. The, everything that has a ca cause has an effect to its cause, right? So every effect has a cause to it. It has a reason that brought about the effect, that the effect taken place. So in this case, the effect is coming into existence that causes something else that brought it into existence. The universe had uh, began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause to its existence, uh, or the effect is that the universe came into existence. Um, now, in order, uh, in this argument, in order to prove the two, the, the conclusion fault, you have to prove that the two, that the, um, Premises are false, and it's a deductive argument, and it's a valid deductive argument. Uh, the universe, indeed, had the beginning to its existence. So I've established premise one. Premise two, the universe had the beginning to its existence, um, thanks to the discovery, uh, uh, to the theory of general relativity by Einstein, uh, the space-time theorem by Hawking, and uh, Hubble discovery about the expansion of the universe. We've come to uh, the knowledge of the big uh, and even to constant observation. Uh, we can observe close, very, very close within almost minutes, uh, almost seconds actually, to the, uh, of the big bang, of the creation event of the big bang. So the big bang established that the universe had the beginning. Now we can th therefore conclude the universe has a cause. The laws of cause and effect are such that the cause must be greater or equal to the effect. So you cannot have an effect less than the cause. You cannot have the, uh, the effect being greater than the cause that brought it about. Um, so, in this case, um, the effect is coming into existence. You cannot have something that doesn't exist. For example, be the cause of existence. So, so something that that causes existence must be greater than the effect. So it has to a exist to equal to that, or be greater than existing, which is, I'm not sure what greater would be in this case. To so the effect, so the cause must be able to bring the universe into existence. The cause here must not necessarily be God. It could be God. Um, it also could be another universe, uh, a multiverse. You could posit a multiverse here, in which case this universe was came out forth from the previous universe. So this is the cause equal to the effect in the universe, right? Uh, or the cause may be an intelligent, could be an intelligent agent. Beyond the universe, outside the universe, um, the transcendent. This I would argue is God. You either have the universe or you have God. Uh, in this uh, particular scenario, uh, you cannot empirically. There, at least to my knowledge, there's no way to date to empirically validate one or the other. There are mathematical theorems with uh, mathematical theories within. Theoretical physics, uh, physics, uh, particular quantum physics, uh, that posits a multiverse, but there's been no testing, no observation to lead it to believe that there is such a multiverse, uh, that there is multiple universes, much less one that this universe came out of. But we can. Being that it's theoretically possible, uh, a god need not be the cause, it could be the universe itself. I will point out though that a multiverse does not necessarily exclude the possibility of a god either, if that universe itself is at the beginning. 
So the universe, in order for uh, for the argument to work, the previous universe must itself be uncalled. It must be. It must have no beginning. Uh, so that's really what you would have to have there. So, which is theoretically possible. But anyhow, by this argument for the system of God, all I've did is argue for a causal agent beyond space and time, beyond this universe that brought the universe into existence. Could be a universe. It could be a God. Uh, doesn't necessarily, even if we do say it's a God, it's God. Doesn't necessarily mean the God of the Bible either. Uh, the spa second argument is the space-time theorem uh, state that uh, that space and time have a beginning in the Big Bang. Uh, and, and the space-time theorem of general relativity come forth. Uh, uh, the first one is produced or published by Stephen Hawking, in which he was trying to uh, seek the implication to figure out what the implication of the uh, theory, theory of Einstein uh, were. And I can't remember all exactly what else he was trying to do, but in any case, in this theorem, he demonstrated, he proved that space and time are really the same uh, and that they have a beginning and that the beginning is in the Big Bang. To, to the Big Bang is the beginning of space and time. Furthermore, the, the theorem demonstrates that you have a finite amount of, uh, of energy within the universe. And that energy that, for example, black holes or whatever, um, can trap light into it that, that it cannot escape. The Big Bang being the beginning of space, down to the beginning of black hole, to the metric then, how do you have... Um, um, really energy that really escaped the black hole. Uh, you'd have to have an expansion rate uh, that that's just right, if you will, but that's a different argument in of itself. But the theorem concludes with arguing that a, for a transcendent uh, causal agent. Basically, the argument goes as follows. If the universe contained mass, and if the theory of relativity, general relativity is accurately described the motion of the bodies of the universe, then the universe has a causal agent beyond space, time, energy, and matter. In again, in order for the conclusion to be false, you have to demonstrate that the premises are false. The premises in this case are that the universe contains mass, and that the theory of relativity accurately describes the motion of the bodies of the universe, or the, uh, including light itself uh, and particles. Um, also, one of the theorems of course you have a beginning in space and time. Does the universe contain the mass? The answer is yes. We know this by weighing objects. Uh, if you don't believe that they contain mass, you should get on the on a scale and weigh yourself. If you weigh anything over an ounce, um, actually even under an ounce, for that matter, if you weigh, uh, and, and again, if you, if you weigh anything over a pound, uh, stuff to say, or even over uh, an ounce, uh, you just proven that mass exists. Um, and, and this is not only way things here on Earth, you can, uh, Jupiter, Mars, everything, you still have, you still weigh something out in those spaces. In fact, NASA actually has, um, I'm thinking Kennedy Space Center, I may, may, may not be correct there. Um, it has almost like a ride, not even a ride, a a center in which you can see what you weigh on bad planets. Uh, you weigh like tons uh, upon Jupiter. Uh, so yes, mass exists. Uh, so we have demonstrated this to be the case. The last time I checked, Earth 
is part of the universe by virtue of being part of the of the solar system, which is a part of the universe. Uh, the, the theory of general relativity accurately describes the motions of the bodies of the universe. The answer is yes. Um, in fact, it uh, it does so more accurately than Newtonian physics does. Um, not to discard Newtonian physics. Uh, it The theory of relativity has been tested multiple times, at least ten. In each case, it has withstood the test. Uh, in fact, it's been... Recently, I think this past year or two, um, had been put to the test when scientists in a lab thought they discovered, um, I can't remember what object, um, a molecule or object that they uh, thought they discovered that wound up traveling, or they believed or seemed to be traveling the speed of faster than the speed of light, which is according to Einstein, shouldn't be possible. Or, actually, Einstein's theory said that you can't have something accelerate faster, uh, accelerate past the speed of light. Um, but in any case, in, in which they published in the scientific com uh, journal uh, to the scientific community to be tested to see if their work was accurate, um, it, something wound up to where they either made a mistake or something of that nature. I can't remember what the problem was. But that was resolved. It, the theory of relativity was re-put to the test. And it was, um, came out just fine. Uh, so far, it, it withheld every single test um, to date. It did one of the most tested and re most reliable uh, theory in all of physics. So, the, so, in both physics, have uh, determined that the universe contains mass. The universe, uh, the theory of relativity is accurate. Uh, and therefore, the conclusion is true that the universe has a causal agent beyond or that transcends space, time, energy, and matter. And we say this because the Big Bang is the beginning of space and time, as well as energy and matter. And we say energy and matter simply because energy and matter are the same. Uh, e equals mc square demonstrates this to be the case. Uh, the energy equals mass times uh, the constant speed of light square, matter time, uh, the constant speed of light square. Uh, so energy is matter, or it's right, matter is energy in a different form. Argument number uh, uh, three. Uh, all right, before I do argument number three, I will um, note that my previous example that this causal agent, again, doesn't necessarily mean that the causal agent is God. It's reasonable to believe it is, but it doesn't demonstrate that it is. It could, again, be the universe. Or another, sorry, another universe it must be equal to or greater than the effect. Argument three, however, I would argue, does cut it. In this case, the universe began as an explosion of energy known as the Big Bang. So this is the background to um, the third argument and the final argument for the existence um, that of uh, of sentient life form or the existence of sentient life form. Here, the universe began as an explosion of energy known as the Big Bang. Uh, by explosion, what we mean is not the same as a bomb going off. So we don't mean something, a uh, fire, uh, energy going off and creating disaster or what have you. We don't mean that. What we mean by explosion, just simple, uh, we mean... That the universe rapidly expanded, uh, basically, or the energy rapidly uh, expanded the uh, to space uh, outward. So, we have a massive quote, explosion of energy or popping into existence of energy uh, within the Big Bang of uh, space in the beginning of space and time. Uh, the universe in this 
in this uh, the Big Bang uh, theory began as a as a small tiny space um, no no the point of singularity uh, that within the space that after its initial expansion and would you have this um, uh, inflationary window that took place as well but I think that that actually happened sometimes after the event we're describing here within uh, a short uh, series of time following the moment of creation of the Big Bang um, not seconds I can't remember it quote a second nano nanoseconds or something uh, I just can't remember the exact time frame but shortly after the Big Bang or shortly after this explosion of energy what the byproduct that came out of it was a with energy that was um, that was highly concentrated, uh, known as electromagnetic uh, radiation, which basically is light. Uh, it is a super powerful light beam. Uh, so this is the byproduct, the product that came immediately out for it from the Big Bang uh, creation event with its explosion of energy. To the first thing that came into existence was if you know, light, uh, this light beam, this uh, this radiation, this energy, eventually evolved or developed into the element that we see on the periodical chart. Uh, first with helium and then o oxygen, uh, from which you have the molecule uh, the building blocks of life, that requirement for life, particularly life on Earth. Uh, they're not oxygen, sorry, helium and then carbon. Um, and this, from there you have the building block to the rest of the molecule. Um, that these eventually become matter, or become mass, or matter. That the matter, the matter becomes a life, uh, or becomes a living. So it becomes uh, biological systems uh, upon the Earth, which is, such as um, uh, such as cells and and what have you, uh, and plants and and then animals and the life develop into a sentient being that are you and I. So they became human who have the capacity to think and to self reflect and to have the philosophical question and seeking to answer them uh, into seeking life's meaning and purpose and to be able to feel love, joy, peace, happiness and yada yada yada. So light beam become sentient. Light beam become an entity that has a mind. So the question is how is it that light beam, how is it that energy become comes into being as a sentient life form, as a life form that can feel things, that can have expressions of love, sorrow, regret, and experience joy, pain, and sorrow. Um, how, how is it? I mean, you can't have uh, the, 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 the energy is not it's sentient. How how is it that light beam that that the that the inanimate that the physical and chemical become mind become non physical become non chemical things or abstractions like love and joy and become a being that can at least have a concept of these abstractions. And the mind is non-physical, as far as we can tell, the mind is distinct from the brain. The brain is just a series of chemicals, or neurons, and electrons. It, you're dealing with just basic physics. You're dealing with the physical. You're dealing with, uh, with matter. But how did that matter? How did that the physical, these elements, and um, 
the rocks become living, speaking, intelligent human being or being. The laws, to, to keep in mind that the effect here is ma that the living comes into existence from the non-living. The effect here, is, or that the non-living becomes living, the effect here, here is that the light beams or that matter become, the elements become thinking sentient entity. That's the effect. That the cause, the laws of causation, are such that the cause must be greater or to than or equal to the effect. So here the cause must be that the creation of, uh, so it's being that the effect of the creation of sentient life, the cause must be a sentient life equal to or greater than human being. Uh, it cannot be less than that. So you can, the cause cannot be a uh, a non sentient um, causation. It has to be sentient. The sentient life must either be an extraterrestrial, alien, or a god. These are the really two theories that you have here. Uh, the problem with aliens, the reason why I don't believe it is that because aliens uh, exist, generally are said to exist within space and time. So their full existence within space and time. Why is this a problem? Is because if they exist within space and time, that they too must have evolved into existence or developed into existence uh, from the initial Big Bang. So the problem here is not solved, it's really exacerbated. Uh, the aliens here must have evolved, uh, developed, and then not only developed, but then have enough time to develop, also have enough time to create their spacecraft or whatever the time uh, travel machines or whatever, and then travel across the universe to get to the planet Earth to in order to eventually um, implant life uh, on Earth, uh, namely uh, to implant human beings, right? These are really what you would have to have, and and, and keep in mind that human beings came onto the scene uh, roughly 50 to 100,000 years ago. So, um, to exacerbate the problem, the alien, uh, and extraterrestrials exist, and they are, and they exist, or set to exist within, um, space and time, or within the universe, then they too were, some were a product of the initial Big Bang, and of this matter becoming sentient. So therefore, a sentient being if you want to deal with the problem of um, infinite regression, the sentient being must therefore be beyond space and time. Uh, so here, the causal agent that we established that must exist by argument one and two, it can't be the universe itself, unless the universe is conscious, but rather it must be an intelligent agent with its own mind, will, and emotions. Must be a sentient agent capable of of inspection and, and thinking and having plans and experiencing a lot of joy and peace and what have you. And here I have just described God. God is such a being. So these are the three or arguments that I have presented an argument in this episode for the existence of God. Again, to recap, argument number one establishes that a, that a causal agent uh, that brought about the universe must exist. Argument, and we do this for the law that anything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe has a cause. Or the universe at the beginning, therefore it has a cause. Argument two was that the universe must have a cause that transcends space and time due to the space-time theorem of general relativity, uh, and the premise of, uh, of that. Uh, and here, the argument three is that such causal agent must be a sentient being. 
Uh, so, and we know this because matter cannot, uh, you have a, uh, you have sentient life form mind, a, a non-physical entity that has came into existence. And the question, how did it come into existence from light, from light beams? So everything that we are, our bodies, all, it's just matter, material, and existed as energy at the point of Big Bang. Everything that current, that you see currently around you exists at the, uh, at the Big Bang in the form of energy. So how did the energy become sentient? That's the, 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 the trick. That, the, the, that is the real big question and the only real answer, logical answer, if you follow the laws of causation, is that a sentient being that transcends space and time brought human beings into existence. And that being is classically described as God. Thank you for watching um, Divine Anarchy. Um, again, I am your host, Matthew Mansell. You're watching this on Voluntary Virtue. You can watch it every Saturday at 10 to 10.30 Eastern Standard Time. Um, that 10 to 10.30 p.m., by the way, in the evening. Uh, next week, I'll be continue discussing argument for the existence of God um, on, on a different uh, track. Uh, so it'd be somewhat different than the argument that you have heard here. So hopefully you'll tune in next week. Uh, please put comments into the on uh, into the uh, comment section below. I would I highly respect uh, feedback. Uh, shalom, shalom. May God bless. Uh, continue. Uh, stop.